With that, let's get started. We're here to discuss the 2016 documentary Accidental Courtesy, which is about Daryl Davis, a black jazz musician whose work be befriending Ku Klux Klan members is motivated by the question, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? Mr. Davis's approach is to build one-to-one -one relationships with KKK members, listening when they don't think the opinion of a black man is worth hearing, and talking when they eventually do. He says, quote, if you and I agree, I'm not accomplishing anything if I'm trying to convince you of what you already know. The way you resolve that is you invite somebody at the table who disagrees with you, so you'd understand why they have that point of view. Then perhaps you will, you will figure out a solution to dissuade their fears. Davis claims that he's directly responsible for 60 people leaving the Ku Klux Klan and indirectly responsible for 200. More than two dozen of them have given Davis their robes and hoods. So this documentary offers such rich material to discuss. And my first question to you is, and raise your hand if you'd like to talk, uh, what similarities and differences do you see between what Daryl Davis is doing and what Braver Angels does? And I see Libby Markowitz. You wanna unmute yourself and talk? Well, yes, definitely. I see that um, the same approach is about just listening to another point of view without trying to really um, um, just be a good listener. And I definitely do see that there is a similarity. Okay. Thank you, Libby. Okay. And how about uh, Cheryl Hobbs? You want to unmute yourself, Cheryl? Yes, um, I saw that uh, they're pretty much the same, uh, that they, each one is concerned about their, um, their viewpoint. And uh, it just, I, I just saw a whole lot of similarities, which um, I had never really paid attention to. Hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, and how about Linda Thompson? <clears throat> Linda, you want to unmute yourself? Yes. I was getting a glass of water, but <laughs> did you say similar similarities or differences? Correct, yes. Uh, the difference, I guess, is that, you know, it's, it's person to person. You know, it's definitely one person talking to one person, but um, there are a lot of similarities as well. Mm -hmm. And heads up, uh, actually, we will be having uh, our one-to-one -one type conversation as part of what Braver Angels offers. Um, we are still, we're almost done with the testing the technology, but it will be a one-to-one -one black, white conversation, red, to blue conversation or rural urban conversation. So that is coming up. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna um, move on to the next question, um, which is that uh, Daryl Davis takes the camera crew across the country visiting current and former KKK members where they live. And he also visits sites that are highly significant to the history of blacks in America. Why do you think he takes this approach? Um, Melanie, do you have your hand raised from this time around or last time? La last time. Okay, got it. We didn't lower hands. Uh, could, Sam, could you okay. repeat it? Could you repeat the question one more time, Donna? Yes, but while I'm repeating it, Stanley will have you answer it. Um, so. Uh, Davis takes the camera crew across the country visiting current and former KKK members where they live, and then also visiting sites that are highly significant to the history of Blacks in America. Why do you think he takes that approach? Uh, Stanley? Well, first of all, uh, <clears throat> they're in their home territory, so they're much more comfortable um, in doing that. So already they start to ease because they just like in a baseball game, you're in your home state or city, 
well, you have an advantage, or at least a perceived advantage. Uh, if he tried to drag them into a African American neighborhood and discuss things with them, uh, he might not be anywhere near. Uh, um, St Stan, so I, we understand your point that he's um, talking to people where they're comfortable. Uh, you're, you're back, Stan? Yes. Okay, anything else you'd like to say? No. No, okay. <coughs> That's a very good point. Um, thank you. Uh, Kathy Shapiro. Okay, um, this is maybe a, a place to in something that I had noticed in the movie that may be a place that would apply to this question is that so so I think that the talking to the KKK going to places where you can talk to KKK members like I think that's the main point of the movie so but the going to places with sight significant to um, African Americans is what I think you um, how you worded that second part mm -hmm. and then that um, allowed him to talk to African Americans that were passionate and um, I, I think if I'm on the key, um, but talk to them, you know, where there were protests and things where they were passionate about the um, Black Lives Matter movement. And one thing, um, so he wanted to be able to talk with them too. And just something that really struck me and that has struck me in a lot of different things that I've heard is that it, you know, it was, I think there's some challenges almost more so of talking within the, the African-American group than talk, for him talking to the KKK members. It's almost, and I'm seeing this pattern, it's almost within a group, it's harder to accept that people are not like, right there with them and so they were and so it was not only hard for the black lives matter um leaders to accept him but i noticed that he started using terms like ignorant he didn't have that same way of diffusing and and respecting his own african americans that were rebelling against him that he did with the KKK members. So I was just really struck by that. So I kind of thought I'd throw that into where he visited those sites. Right, and so we're gonna be talking specifically about that in, in a, a next question. So oh. hold that thought, but you're right. You're absolutely right, but, okay. Uh, and, and Melanie Banks, your turn. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed this uh, documentary. Um, I think the points of America um, that you're talking about is the fact that I felt like I was being educated, that it was helpful to me as a viewer. Is Am I on track, Donna? I mean, it's uh, it, it felt like we were going to different places and I was being carried along so that I could see points uh, the hotel well, where uh, Martin Luther King was shot and that beautiful uh, exchange was for me a great education piece. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I think I'll address that part of, of your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he was, he was bringing us along, he was educating us at the same time uh, that he was uh, talking about the KKK as well. Okay, and we'll take uh, one more, Gladys, Gladys Robinson. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I saw it in two different ways, that it was the experience of what he was going through with the people he interviewed, and then certainly the experience that we as the viewers were going through, and using the approach that he did just made it so much more personal and gave me a deeper understanding of what was going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. I would, one more because Lauren's had her hand up a long time. Lauren, Scott? No, I, I think my hand was just up from when you had us tested. I can't actually see that my hand is up, so oh. sorry about that. Okay, no problem. Okay, so um, the, the next question um, 
is, is that one of the most memorable scenes in the movie is where Davis talks with three Black Lives Matter activists. They were in Baltimore protesting uh, the death of Freddie Gray, who was arrested in April 2015 and while being transported in a police van, suffered injuries to his spinal cord that killed him. Activist Kwame Rose says that he isn't going to vote in the 2016 presidential election. And he tells Davis, infiltrating the Klan isn't freeing your people. Stop wasting your time going into people's houses where they don't love you. You're nothing but a pimp in a pulpit. And Davis responded, so you believe that nobody can change? You're nothing but ignorant. Activist J.C. Falk said that Davis's disrespect of Kwame Rose and Tariq Touré was reprehensible. Falk said Davis could do, have done a lot more work in the 90s until now to move Black people forward. He asked, where were you when the marches were going on? Sitting with your Klan people. And a relating criticism I've seen elsewhere is that Davis is not working to change the system. His approach is cult deprogramming. So what is your reaction to all of this? Uh, Sanjay. Um, so I, I agree with the, um, the activists. I, I think now I'm not saying that Davis is not making change. He is making change, obviously, but the changes he's, he's making um, are very slow um, and they are not um, substantial. Uh, I think that the, in, during the 30 years that he's been active, that Davis has been active, um, you know, systemic racism has become even more entrenched and even more um, pervasive and, and even more violent. And that's a serious problem we need to address. And I think that that's what um, that conversation was about, that um, Davis has, has not been making the change, given the power and the, um, the, uh, the voice that he has, has achieved, he can do a lot more um, in other ways rather than trying to make um, just a few people change their mind. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, thank you, Sanjay. Um, and we also have uh, Molly Zeff. I wanted to mention that I thought that was probably one of the only really painful scenes of the movie to watch. Yeah. Um, I felt like the movie was this triumph of the human spirit and human capacity to, to be willing to be changed and human capacity to bring about change. And for me, that was like, yeah, I see some folks nodding and, and so on. Um, I felt, I mean, I wasn't gonna, didn't feel like crime, but I felt like, oh, like, I just wanna see this scene again. It was like pain, painful to know it was real. And I think for me, um, it, it, the conversation kind of hinged on the absence of two things. One was the capacity to really listen. I feel like the word ignorant was a, was a I would say, an example of cancel culture, um, of shutting someone down um, because you're not, in, in, you're, you're, you're setting yourself above them when you use the word ignorant. And two was there was some real, there was real lack of knowledge. I, I would have personally, I think in that situation, I think it's a really hard one to be in, but I, I think personally I would have brought up the knowledge he was ignorant of instead of using the, the word ignorant. So for example, and I, I felt like what was missing from that scene was, was knowledge on the activist part that a lot of um, white supremacist activism for decades led to changes in political rhetoric that have then influenced policy later. And I felt like there was an, and I'm getting that from the book Rising Out of Hatred about the, the changing of a white nationalist, um, which is about Derek Black's journey out of white nationalism and white supremacy. And I, I, I thought like, you know what, like they're right and they're wrong. Like he isn't sitting there changing power structures and changing racial equality. But what he is doing, he's, he's changing people at the fringes who do have real proven influence over political rhetoric. And so um, that was frustrating just to see the, the lack of listening happening with what they were calling his own people when like he was able to really effectively use the tools. I think he let down his guard because he was more comfortable in a, in, a, in a way. Okay, thank you, Molly. Um, how about Audrey Balloon? Audrey, are you there? Okay, yeah, I am. Okay, first of all, um, I wanted to speak to what Sanjay said and Molly said uh, about how effective it is. What is effectiveness? 
Um, well, even with Black Lives Matter now, I mean, people don't understand the, the, the charter and that's bothersome to me, but any kind of violent activism doesn't win friends and influence people. It may do it on the surface. You may, they may get laws passed, and, but you don't change people's hearts by being violent. You may frighten them, but fear never changes hearts. Um, and so I think they're both right. You have to have a balance. Everything is a balance. You have to have the activism, but not in a way that makes people fearful. If you, for example, Black Lives Matter, somebody just said, if you don't give us what we want, we'll burn down your cities. Well, that doesn't, again, doesn't win friends and influence people. And so you, you have to do, you, you do need the activism in a legal, um, in a legal and, um, and civil matter, manner manner and then you do need one-to-one -one, as davis did you have to be able to change hearts by get people getting to know each other and there isn't any it's n neither one by itself is going to work because davis is too slow and the other one is 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 a bull in a china shop and so yeah, so Audrey, are you telling me that you believe Black Lives Matter is an inherently violent organization? It is. If you read the charter, it absolutely is. It's, uh, the founders have said that they're Marxists. They are Marxists. You read the charter, they're anti-Semitic. It's, it's, they have a great PR campaign going. And I think that a lot of people want to, to um, I mean, I'm, it's not my my view. It's the charter. Read the charter, and uh, but they have a great PR campaign because nobody is nobody realizes that. Very few people realize okay. that. Okay. So thank you, Audrey. If anyone has a different view of Black Lives Matter, please go ahead and chat one of my two co-hosts and ask to be recognized. Um, to, but, if you have but, a different view. My, my point no. was whether, whether it's sit-ins or peaceful stuff or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You have to have both. You have to have Davis and you have to have the activism. Okay, thank you, Audrey. Um, okay, we're going to move on to Paulette Lee. Yes, hi, thank you. I was just doing... Um, so you just want that uh, the thing about the origins of Black Lives Matter, which actually were three women who were defending LGBTQ rights initially, but you want that in a separate response is that am i well, correct talk to say whatever you'd like to say okay so i'd like to address actually that um that scene that i really thought was the most powerful scene and i'm really glad that it was in there the confrontation with the three other black men um because it gave the conflict and i found myself um in two different places through most of it I was kind of in my white liberal state of mind, which, oh, isn't this kind of nice that he's, you know, changing hearts and minds one person at a time. It's a little weird that you've got KKK outfits, but okay, I'll, I'll give you that. And so I was kind of going along with that. And then with the, with the more um, a vibrant, shall we say, discussion with the, other, with the other black men, I was taken back to my days of activism at UC Berkeley where I was a white member of the Black Panthers, although I didn't, you know, I was just, it was just on paper because I supported that, or being a radical feminist. And I found that the radicalism made sense also. And I found myself moved by that more than I was by the more, you know, let's change this one guy's mind. I was not comfortable with him befriending KKK members. Um, but I would like to say just quickly that radical approach does not mean violent. And my recollection is that those guys were not speaking about violence at all. They were talking about establishing an economic base and, um, and, and self-determination. 
Okay, thank you, Paulette. And since we're on the topic of Black Lives Matter, uh, Tony King said she wanted to um, respond uh, to Audrey. Tony? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I just wanted to say that when we have a tendency to group people, that is often where we can lose ground. To say that Black Lives Matter as a group is, is a problem is really not fair and not a complete picture uh, because it may be individuals, just like you see individuals in any fringe group that can get off the rail. But I don't think that that is the intent of the Black Lives Matter and, and the various Black Lives Matters groups around the country. They respond <clears throat> very different so to categorize an entire group, I think that we need to exercise caution when we do that. Okay, thank you, Tony. Okay, and Shanine Martin, you wanna unmute yourself? Uh, unmute yourself, Shanine. Sorry, all right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, so one of the like frequent uh, comments that I saw, like I usually go straight to the comments when I'm watching something, uh, on the documentary and on other stuff about uh, that confrontation. People uh, made the comparison between the Black Lives Matter activists and um, you know the white supremacists that Daryl was helping to uh, um, convert, like saying that they had sort of the same um, mindset as the people that they disagreed with, um, which I thought was interesting. Um, because when you're listening to them, like when you listen to some activists of all, like from all movements, um, the more radical they get, the more crazy they sound, or the more like, I don't want to use the word crazy, but like the more like, the harder it is for like people who don't agree with them uh, to, to understand where they're coming from. I got the same feeling whenever I was listening to like the one lady who was uh, in the Klan, uh, one of the like top people saying something like, that God put white people here to like um, oversee the other races. Like you have to get to like, a pretty extreme place uh, in order to believe something like that, I think. So I, I don't know, I, I just kind of felt like, like I mean, while there, there's merits to each side or whatever, um, I think that like people, the risk of like anything, any sort of like radicalization or any sort of like radical ideology is always that it's harder to like it's harder to have a conversation with someone from outside of that ideology. Okay, thank you, Shanine. Okay, I'll take two more. Um, Lauren, Scott, your, your chance now to talk? Thank you, yes, I figured out the hand raising thing. Um, so, you know, I'm listening to people say that Daryl's approach is, um, is slow, and I, I really appreciate his approach because I feel like if we had more of that dialogue, um, throughout the world, we would be in a much better place. I think it's only slow because we're watching one person do it. Um, I think if all of us were able to engage that way, I mean, this is the ideal, right? Um, and, um, you know, really listen to each other, um, that I think it would be faster. I think we would have more connections. We would lose that anonymity and, um, you know, people would start to see each other as people. Um, I mean, I've, I've had a long held belief that anonymity is at the root of a lot of our, our problems um, and that it's very easy to dismiss what you don't really know and what you don't really have contact with. Um, you know, it's in that difficult scene that everybody's referencing, I, I felt that um, the activists, the young activists were really um, in a frame of mind at that moment where they weren't able to engage and listen. Um, they were so angry that I don't think there could have been an equitable exchange um, at that point. And I, um, I don't necessarily condone how Daryl handled it, but um, both sides have to be in a position of wanting to dialogue and wanting to listen. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kathy Shapiro. Oh, good, you gave me another chance, thank you. Yeah, and I, um, some people mentioned this, um, I, totally think I agree that sometimes it's hard to dialogue when people's emotions are high. Um, I think that both, we're still on that same question, right? About yeah. the, um, okay. I think that um, both um, approaches 
don't contradict each other. And they were, so the, the Black Lives Matter um, people were putting down Daryl for what he was doing and why doesn't he do what they're doing? And then that put him on the defensive and then he, um, you know, started kind of attacking back. Um, I think that people have to do what they're called to do and that's part of the beauty and both are significant and it doesn't matter like one thing is happening faster and the other isn't. Daryl's calling was this, which was serving a humongous purpose and um, their calling was another thing, you know, part of the, the movement that, that served a huge purpose. And I think sometimes people want, I think that's the whole beauty of what we're doing is to appreciate the diversity because both have a, a role. So that's Okay. Beautiful. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and uh, Scott, Scott Sharon um, wants to say something. Oh, um, no, I just, um, yeah, I think, I wouldn't say the highlight for me, but um, certainly that scene in the bar between Kwame and I guess it was Tariq on one side and Daryl on the other was fascinating because obviously just to go reiterate what people were saying, they they couldn't, they had trouble tolerating, understanding that he would sit down with Klansmen, yet the Klansmen were able to, um, they were able to have a conversation that obviously seemed a lot calmer. And I totally understand how Kwame and the two other gentlemen, what they were saying is, you know, calling, thinking he's a salad, saying like, you know, we're on the front lines. It's like disregarding troops that are the ones going in the battle while you get to sit in the back. No, I think Daryl is doing the hard work. I think it takes guts to sit down with someone who barely even recognizes your right to live. Um, and just one other quick thing. Um, I did appreciate being a musician in the beginning when he, he challenged a white supremacist who said, you know, this was Jerry Lee Lewis started this way. And he said, no, that started with blues and, and boogie woogie. And, um, it's just fine because music being, I'm on the music and arts committee for Brave Angels. You know, one of the things to focus on is, is music is such a great way to help bridge the divide because that's something we can all love and share. And something is, I guess, um, as basic as rock and roll. And like, this is actually where it started, but it grew into all these people putting their own flavors in it. And, and just to hear that, like, you know, I guess he said after that they became friends or I forget how that, that story went, but, um, I just, I was attracted to that because I, I, I guess I kind of could see you know, some music as a tool to help bring people together as it's kind of always had, you know, so that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last person, um, Gail. Uh, hello, everybody. Well, I'm, I, I'm probably, so many people have made so many great comments, so I'm probably going to be touching on so many of the things said already, but um, I guess uh, related to the scene in the bar, um, it's, it's hard for me at least to say what works better, you know, does doing the big fight on the front lines, is that more important? Is changing hearts and minds one at a time more important? And Sanjay, I know in the um, last round of questions, you were, you were mentioning that um, your perspective that you thought this was one of those ways was more important. And I'm not sure, I'm curious if that's really quantifiable in any way. Um, and it, it just seems to me that, that there's, there's a role for that, and then there's a role at the same time, and I know that a couple of people have, have touched on this, but there's a role at the same time for someone doing the work that Gerald Davis is doing, while, and not instead of, but while other people are doing the work that those activists are doing. What made me a little bit sad is, um, and I know it's a film and it's edited, and so there was probably a lot of that conversation preceding the confrontational part that we didn't see, um, and I wish we could have seen more of it, but um, it did not seem as if he was approaching those, at, those young activists in the same way that he was approaching the Klansmen. And I know that lots of things impact us in the way of various, I, I teach the topic of implicit bias a lot, and sometimes just being much older than someone makes you think you can school them you know, that they don't, they don't know as much. And, and in addition to, you know, whatever perspectives or point of view that he has, and it just felt like he had approached them in the same way of let me bring you into my world. And hopefully by doing that, expand both of our worlds, which it seemed like he was doing with the Klansmen, that that conversation might have gone to that way. Okay, thank you, Gail. Okay, we're going to move on now. There's just so much to be said about that particular scene. Uh, it was 
uh, so memorable. Um, but our Braver Angels Maryland State Coordinator, Tom Smirling, is on the call, and he lives not far from Daryl Davis. Tom sought out Mr. Davis, got together with him a few times, and asked lots of questions. Tom, what would you like to tell us about Daryl Davis? Well, sure. Um, Daryl lives about in Wheaton, uh, Maryland, about 15 minutes from my home. And uh, he's very much a regular guy. He's no saint. He's not perfect. Uh, a lot of the criticisms, particularly calling the young activists ignorant, are, I think are valid. Uh, and the question about individual change versus systemic change is one that comes up a lot in, in, indeed with better angels. I know plenty of people who say, you're wasting your time talking to, quote, those people on the other side when you should be out uh, organizing, doing political organizing. And as someone, I don't remember who said it, Gail was, I think, one of them that the two are not incompatible. You know, it's like one doesn't cancel the other. Um, I asked uh, Daryl, I probed him in a number of different ways to try and figure out how he did this. How did he approach it, these uh, clan members? And what was his technique, his method, that was so effective in uh, earning their trust and um, getting a lot of them to convert? Um, and what he said, I, I realized he also said in the movie, he said, uh, I didn't convert them. I just listened to them with respect and befriended them. And eventually they converted themselves. So I thought that was, it's a really powerful, interesting model. Um, and a, and a one with a lot of humility. He said, and they didn't, it didn't work with all of them. Um, he only had one physical confrontation he described, but um, it didn't work with all. He's up to about 60 robes now, hmm. and uh, <laughs> which I love. I love that touch. And um, I just think that uh, he's a wonderful inspiration uh, about the power of listening. He said, at one point he said, look, these are the... the the most isolated, despised, disrespected people in the country. Everybody hates them. And um, they've just rarely, they, they joined the Klan and the neo-Nazi movements for, to be accepted, to be welcomed. This is a group that, very similar to what you hear about ISIS and radical uh, Islamic groups, is that they found a home, a community that would accept them as they are, and embrace them. Um, and I think the, the contradiction between the ideology and here's, here's this black man who you're supposed to hate listening to you with respect created a lot of cognitive dissonance for them. And uh, it, would, it was hard to remain friends with Daryl and hold on to their ideology. Um, and I've used Daryl as an example, sometimes people say to me, a lot of people say, I'm sure you've all heard it, you know, whether you're red or blue, you've heard, um, well, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. I could never do that. I could never talk to the, those people. And sometimes I pull out Daryl Davis and I say, well, you know, uh, on the blue side, I'm saying to the blue, I'll say, you know, if Daryl Davis can sit down and listen respectfully and try to understand uh, members of the KKK, I bet you could find it in your heart to sit down with a Trump voter. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's just kind of inspiring. I mean, it's like, if somebody can do that, well, it just, it's hard to say, to say that this kind of um, radical listening is not uh, possible. Thank you, Tom. I'm going to take one question uh, to you, I guess. Uh, Kay Halpern. Oh, um, yeah. Hi, Tom. Actually, um, this wasn't a, not really a question, but I was really intrigued when you talked about how um, Daryl gave, you know, these uh, KKK folks respect 
And um, I've heard um, a former white supremacist, supremacist Christian Picciolini, who also who um, has um, left that movement and um, has written a book and and goes around and lectures. And he talks about and ha how he was recruited into a white supremacist movement, a neo-Nazi movement um, in the 90s, and that he was a kid and he had low self-esteem and he was looking for identity, community, and purpose and respect. And it seems that when Daryl Davis gives the folks that he meets this kind of respect, it's almost like a bridge that allows them, then, then they don't need the KKK anymore because they see that they can get that kind of respect elsewhere. And um, another thing that Picciolini points out, he works with people um, from all kinds of uh, sort of extremist movements, whether it's uh, white supremacists, neo-Nazis, KKK, ISIS, gangs, um, and he had a meeting with a lot of these people It actually, um, and they were people of, of every background, every hue, every, it was kind of interesting, but, um, you know, this idea that um, the people that are attracted th to these kinds of movements, um, they don't really care about the ideology. What they're looking for is a sense of belonging. No. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to um, approach this from a little different point of view, uh, which is uh, Scott Shepard uh, appeared in the movie, a former KKK leader who Davis befriended, and who is now an anti-racism activist. And he said that he projected out his self hatred onto people of color. He said alcoholism, drug problems, racism are all symptoms. I didn't have to address racism. I had to address these issues within myself. Do you think that's true? Absolutely. Uh, so Sanjay, I know you hand your hand up for some other reason, but do you want to answer this one? Um, sure. Um, I think that, uh, yes, I mean, what he said is true. I mean, the, the racism, I don't think racism begins in a person um, out of, you know, their their uh, neighbors or, or people that they run across um, being different from them. Racism arrives in, in a person either from uh, their childhood because it's, it's indoctrinated in them or because they themselves feel um, uh, damaged in a way, for example, socioeconomically or through um, opportunities, um, or they feel that um, other people are getting a benefit that they would like to receive. So I think that um, racism is complex. I mean, I, I look at it from a from a psychological perspective. I think what um, Kay said uh, just a few minutes ago uh, was very important to understand that a sense of belonging is very important. It's really an issue of identity. Um, and when a person loses their identity or their Id identity is a threat, um, I don't mean just white identity, identity at their core level um, that drives people to search for things like racism or, or drugs or you know any other kind of uh, vice. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, Lori Spadaro. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think kind of just at its very core you hear that it's almost it's it's impossible to love somebody else unless or before you can love before you can love yourself in other words you have to really love yourself before you can show that love to anybody else so you know that i just think that that situation of human behavior and emotion is the reason for so much of our division and there's so much trauma because of whatever the reason, childhood trauma, racial trauma, sexual trauma, so, so many things that can happen that can divide a person and cause them to feel shame and not liking themselves. And 
it's much easier to find a scapegoat than to go to therapy or to find somebody to discuss it with. Um, one other quick point I wanted to make is that, you know, I've been trying to talk to Trump people and I find that if I go in with the intention and with the, with the agreement, so before I even sit down, and it's not like we're, we sit down specifically to have a conversation about politics, but if it goes into that, I just kind of say, well, can we agree we're going to have a discussion, not a debate? To me, there's a really big difference between a debate, which is meant to persuade somebody, and a dialogue or a discussion is meant just to listen mm -hmm. and to, to just hear each other's thoughts. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, it's just a, it's a great way to kind of like agree in a, ahead of time that the debate part of is going to be absent. Okay. Okay, Hattie Kerner. Um, I think that the sense of belonging can be influenced by uh, feeling like you're on the outside of popularity. And I spent um, some of my early years living outside of the US and um, I feel like, so I, like as as an American where I was living, there were not many Americans. And I often felt like um, Americans were unpopular. And um, so being unpopular can make you feel like you don't have belonging. And so um, I just, I think, and it kind of going back to the conversation with the activists earlier, I. I felt a little bit for Daryl in that situation, comparing it to my early, my, my living outside the US, because I feel like sometimes popularity can relate to buzzwords, like right now systemic racism, I feel is a buzzword, or even sometimes a race can become, right, especially in the US where everything seems to be popularity driven. I think our race can become a buzzword or an ethnicity can become a buzzword. And um, so it's like a word has a value. And I know that a lot of places right now, a lot of companies are saying certain politicians, that word is not allowed when they advertise. They don't wanna be advertised around a certain politician because they've decided that that's unpopular mm -hmm. and they don't wanna be associated with that brand. But it's like, if we don't accept that everyone is part of, if we can't accept that everyone has a piece of the truth and or like every citizen in this country has a story and everyone has a value, then everyone will feel, some people who aren't popular will feel unbelonging. And I think that's just so dangerous because it, it just makes me feel really bad for those people who aren't like when I, I feel really bad for Daryl when I feel like the activists aren't appreciating what he has done and they're just using these words like systemic systemic racism or data driven or something and it's like it, it just doesn't seem like they even have a sense of belonging for they don't there's no room for belonging and so whenever I hear the word belonging and I hear that it's not um I feel like it's driven by popularity. It always really scares me. Okay, thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna move on, folks, sorry. Um, I'd like you to compare and contrast these two different approaches. Um, so Davis uh, sat down uh, and talked to one-on-one -on -one with Pastor Thomas Robb. He's the head of the Knights of the KKK in Harrison, Arkansas. Davis acknowledged the KKK's right to put up a billboard advertising White Pride Radio. We don't really see any change on Pastor Rob's part during that segment. Uh, uh, now, another person recently, videographer Rob Bliss, stood underneath that very billboard in Harrisonburg, holding up a sign that says Black Lives Matter. And then he filmed, a, he filmed people spewing hatred toward him. His video has been viewed almost 1 million times. Um, so two very different approaches. Does, would someone like to talk about that? Uh, 
trying to get people who, who haven't spoken yet, uh, but everybody has. Um, so uh, in that case, um, Tom Smerling. Two very quick things, uh, Daryl. Uh, I think it also is the movie. He's, he's not on the classic blue side and the debate over freedom of speech versus hate speech. He believes everybody should be given a, a, a forum and be listened to and shouldn't be censored. He's not, uh, he opposes the uh, getting rid of Confederate symbols and so forth. So he's, he's not always easy to predict. There was something else in talking that he stressed, and he mentioned only briefly in the movie, was the, the norm of reciprocity, the, um, the unwritten rule that if people will respond in kind, if you listen to them with respect long enough, there's a pretty strong norm for, their, for them to reciprocate in the same way. And um, I've, I've noticed that myself, that when I worked on the Middle East, that the most angry blowhard, if you listen, if you can stomach it and listen long enough, sooner or later, they'll run out of things to say and they'll say, so what do you think? <laughs> So he, he really talks about reciprocity, the power of reciprocity. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, let's see, Paulette, Lee. Um, thank you. Actually, I just removed my oh. hand because I wanted to address the previous thing that you were talking about. So. Well, I, I just called on you to say something. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, exercise, uh, suggest that we exercise caution between uh, likening or conflating extremists who have a need, you know, to to for community and so forth, or whatever drives them, and movements that are movements for equality and for. Uh, freedom and peace and, and so forth. I personally don't see them as being the same things, um, having been active both in civil rights and peace and justice for Palestine and women's rights and so forth. Those are, those are things trying to attain a goal as Black Lives Matter is, in my opinion, versus um, the kinds of things that someone was talking about, you know, whether it's ISIS or gangs or, or, or that. So, that was my only concern that they're being conflated and I don't see them that way. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kay Halpern? Um, yeah, well, first of all, I wasn't um, conflating activists on behalf of social justice with gangs or ISIS or anything. I was talking about, you know, extremist groups like white supremacists and KKK and ISIS and that sort of thing. Um, and, but kind of to Tom's point about reciprocity, and if you listen to someone long enough, even if their views are very ex extreme, um, you know, and eventually they'll ask, so what do you think? It struck me, I was so troubled by that um, part of the film where Daryl is meeting with the young black activist that he did not show reciprocity toward them. It, it seemed, I think someone mentioned before, he did not treat them, I thought, as uh, with as much respect as he treated the, um, the white, KKK folks that he was meeting with. Um, there may be a number of reasons for that, but it just, it left, I, I mean, I, I admired the fact that he let, that Daryl let the filming go on and that this was included. It made the cut, it was in the film because it doesn't show him in a very good light. Um, but I was very frustrated by that interaction and think, and I think he could have handled it better. Okay, thank you. And Shannon Martin? Uh, unmute yourself, please. I'll learn eventually. Um, well, in the movie, just in response to the last comment, uh, so what I thought was interesting, uh, when he talks about the first Klansman he ever met, it was in a bar and the Klansman comes up to him and like compliments him, him on his music. And it's like having like this interesting like, 
he's just like blown away that he's talking to this black person for the first time in his life or whatever. Um, but when you compare that to the first interaction with Kwame, I think it was Kwame, uh, Kwame said something like, um, he, he's being a bit condescending. He says, you were, you're the first black Klansman or something like that. And Daryl corrects him uh, and says, I'm not in the Klan. So um, I don't know, I thought maybe like, maybe that what we saw in that last clip, uh, that blow up between them might have been precipitated by like a lot of ill will coming towards the other side. I hope we don't quite know. Um, but what's interesting is, um, there's a, um, after the movie came out, Kwame, like, did some sort of a promotional event with, uh, with Daryl, and, like, I felt like he, like, he still disagreed with Daryl, but, like, they were getting along, and I kind of felt like people go through stages of, like, um, where, of their, like, whenever he's explaining what he believes, why he doesn't agree with Daryl, it kind of sounds like he's trying to convince himself, um, so, like, maybe it appears sometimes, like, someone, uh, isn't being converted or what have you, but like I think it takes time. Uh, people have to like gradually shed various parts of their old ideology. Um, but anyhow. Okay. Okay. Very good. I've got one more question. I think that is appropriate for us to end on. Um, the movie itself ends with the election of Donald Trump. Davis says Trump is doing us a favor because he is bringing out all the ugliness from under the carpet. We can't address it until we see it. What's your reaction to this? Okay, Sanji, I'll, I'll call on you again. Go ahead. Um, I think he's totally wrong on that. Um, I mean, in one sense, yes, Trump is bringing out um, a lot of the ugliness, but more dangerous is that he's um, enabling that ugliness and he's, he's uh, enlarging it uh, in, in tremendous ways. So in, in, in a sense, Trump is... Do, has undone basically everything that um, uh, Mr. Davis has spent his, uh, you know, a long period uh, trying to, to change. So I, I, I think that, I think he doesn't understand the danger from Trump when he, when he made that statement. Okay, thank you. Uh, Carolyn Dumas. I was gonna say we are definitely seeing it now. Um, just from, tweets from um, interviews and things and just from what I'm reading I've never really followed him before until just these recent things that have been happening and I just don't know how November is gonna look like okay okay and and again the the, the point is that uh, Trump is um, bringing all the ugliness out from under the carpet and we're seeing it so in one sense uh, he's doing us a favor. Um, Glenda Noble. Glenda Noble. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Well, thank you. This is my first opportunity to join this group, although I've heard a lot about you. And I want to thank everyone for, for their very uh, well thought questions and answers. Um, I, as I was listening to the discussion, earlier on during the discussion, I heard someone voice an opinion about Black Lives Matter and about uh, violence being in the char charter. And that bothered me. So while I was listening, I Googled the charter of Black Lives Matter and I see nothing like that in the charter. The final sentence states, we embody and practice justice, liberation, and peace in our engagement with one another. And I just wanted to correct that because I do, I am an advocate for Black Lives Matter. So I, and I hate to let anything pass that bothers me like that. Thank you for letting me speak. Okay, thank you, Glenda. Um, Libby Markowitz. Hi, uh, yes. Um, in response to uh, what you said about uh, I don't think Trump himself brought out, uh, I think he did amplify um, the worst of our nature. And I think that um, we really see um, the prejudice and people are beginning to examine their own uh, prejudice or maybe their own uh, 
patterns and you see it a lot on the internet too. So in some ways he did do us a favor, but I think it was present all along. He just amplified the worst of what is possible in all of us. Okay, thank you. Melanie Banks. Thank you. Yeah, um, I thought Daryl's statement at the end was, um, a, you know, it was the 2016 before, I mean, we just really became, um, tragically, we just became um, introduced to uh, Donald Trump for, for me personally. And I felt like his statement was, you know, prophetic. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, Donna, that we can't see it if we can't can't see it. There was also a statement that Daryl said something along that lines, whether he knows it or not. And yeah. I felt like that was that was the uh, really um, prophetic statement that broadened. You know, we've just been horrified at each each day, especially uh, this past year uh but at 2016 we didn't know you know it was going to be revealed and i really thought that was um a real dynamic way to end and it surprised me that it was a 2016 end so okay. with that i'll pass thanks thank you um and i'm just gonna end with this this quote from tony king um has uh, by brennan manning um, that which is denied cannot be healed, uh, which kind of goes along with, with the, what Daryl Davis said, whether you agree with him or not. Um, and so with that, I want to thank you all for uh, watching the movie and participating in this film discussion. We're uh, just thrilled uh, that so many people came and uh, that, that we had so many interesting points of view here.